Good afternoon again. I need to thank the Foundation and the Chairperson as well for the kind invitation to be part of this panel. Plus, if this is twice as good as uh, uh, appreciation because I'm not an expert in universal jurisdiction. I have to say that my only experience as a lawyer regarding this topic was the defense of uh, Justice uh, Garton in one of the trials he was brought to uh, the court, Spanish court, for having prosecuted crimes and the friend was regime. I guess there could not be a more important experience for a Spanish law, actually a global lawyer, sorry, uh, than to advocate the flagship of universal jurisdiction for the, the prosecution of international crimes, which this was an experience a bit bitter and sweet at the same time for me, because it ended up with the acquittal of Justice Rajon, but this trial was a trial that was embedded into other procedural initiatives or proceedings against Garzón. They, there were three claims filed against him, Actually, they were just one, but divided into three, and it ended up in his professional suspension, suspension as a judge at the High Court. Anyway, we are here to discuss present and future of universal jurisdiction. I am not an expert. I'll give you my opinion about present and future here in Spain. Let me recall something that Horacio Berbita said yesterday. It is not law legislation, it is not judges that work independently. They always depend on the social and political context where they are being used. I fully agree with this approach, and I have a reference to the social and political context in Spain, in my opinion, regarding this. Let me go back to May 2009 which was a terrible month for universal jurisdiction in Spain because just within a week there was first on May 19th in Spanish Parliament there was a joint approval by the Popular Party and the Socialist Party where they passed an amendment an act about the creation of a legal office where they would mm, whereby they would amend Article Number 23. This amendment, in turn, led to Organic Law 1, 2009, which was actually the first limitation to the scope of universal jurisdiction, contrary to, what, to how it had been defined since 85 to 2009. As you know, that was the principle of universal jurisdiction understood in absolute terms. So, for international law crimes, as, apart from genocide, there was no need to have any kind of connection or link to Spain. As my dear colleague, Professor Oye, explained, the principle of universal jurisdiction had been enforced peacefully ever since 85 for crimes that he calls second rank international crimes, meaning international crimes where there is no involvement of high commanders or senior public officials or where there is no political connotation. Typical example that it's given as a source of universal jurisdiction would be piracy, naval piracy, at attacks on public health, drug dealing, etc. But ever since we had Madrid trials and then in 88, 98, sorry, that's when this starts to be upset in this universal jurisdiction idea. And the arrest warrant against Pinochet, General, General Pinochet, it's the starting point, the trigger for all initiatives 
both in jurisprudence, case law and legislation, are started ever since to limit the scope of universal jurisdiction. And so, in May 2009, we see the convergence of both attempts. There is interaction between case law, Supreme Court, and legislative initiatives, and the initiative approved by consensus uh, by both on consensus by both main political parties, we see how connection prerequisites are included. For example, Guatemala, 2003, it, they've been set forth beyond the law, legal constraints. So these were new prerequisites or requirements for Spanish courts to investigate an international law crime committed outside of Spain. According to that sentence, there would be necessary to modulate the implementation of universal jurisdiction, and so there was uh, the need to have Spanish victims, perpetrators living in Spain, or some other kind of connection with Spain. This is exactly the formula that hand in hand it was both political parties, the popular party and, and the socialist party, and it was passed in 2009. Then, uh, a week later, Supreme Court admits or allows the proceedings or the first claim against Valdezar Garzón by Manos Limpias, which is a Franco a union following Franco's idea, ideology, and they advocate the identity of the Spanish people against other peoples of the world. And this other one is Libertad and Identidad, and another one that is known as the Spanish Falange. Well, I guess there are four basic sentences from the Supreme Court having to do with universal jurisdiction Guatemala 2003, that's first. Secondly, Farungon's case, which ratifies again the criteria from the Guatemala sentence, this is 2006, these are all for plenary sessions in the second chamber, so taken by all judges there. Then we would have Shilinska's case, where, well, I guess Carlos can give us detailed information since he worked as a lawyer there. And finally, sentence for civil war by Justice Garzón. As you know, the first one are in annulment in cassation, which were a review of our decisions by the High Court. Uh, Justice Garzón's case, it is a, a trial where they become a prosecuting entity. But the general action lines, the limiting laws for the enforcement of universal jurisdiction for the understanding of international law as enforceable in Spain are defined and they follow a continuum along these sentences down to God's own sentence. Although he was a judge, you all know that it is decided, it is ruled that International law standards are not directly enforceable in Spain for the creation of offenses, definitions, offense definitions that are implemented in Spain. So they use legality as a principle understood in conservative terms. It would be a law, then it to be written, then it to be published. So this is domestic law. This is the theoretical message of the sentence, which at the same time, there is an acquittal of justice. Carthon, it closes the door um, and prohibits uh, and, and, and precludes the investigation of, criminal, of international crimes. With this understanding of case law, and with this legal background, we have to say that the recent organic law that was enacted this year, well, it, it, it hasn't surprised us. It's just the combination result in an attempt to segment in Spain and diminish in Spain the concept of universal jurisdiction without taking into account any connection to 
the court were the enforcing court or country. So it only takes into account the nature of the crime that it's being prosecuted. With this background in mind, the political context couldn't be any more negative. I guess that the only difference between the right wing in the parliament in Spain from the rest of Europe is that it's not lay and is not fighting the crimes of Franco's regime. And the Franco's regime, they didn't want to enforce the historical memory law, although it was limited because it was only limited reparation for victims from civil war. And it's not because of the lack of resources, which is just a pretext. And it's just that they don't understand the latency or the reason, the underlying motive or reason for this law. They don't see what's legal good that it's governed by this law. And the left-wing parliament members find this background that doesn't matter whether they are in the opposition and they say that it will repeal the organic law that has been passed, but still, I'm not sure, because they were the ones who opened the way down this path, opened the door to this path. And so the only way, and trying to be optimistic when looking into the future, is to think of the social context. And out of the social context, I, I'm focusing on victims and victims' association. That's where we see in all fields that they are becoming stronger, that they are becoming more present. And we see examples inside and outside of Spain. And they are becoming more visible. They are speaking at victims themselves. They are playing and they're influencing policymakers and society and, and our only hope is that in and outside Spain our hope lies with the victims and their associations. Thank you very much. I have a question for you that it is linked to the long list of acknowledgments of Carlos Lepoy. I think that his acknowledgments have to do with the idea that these trials were created or fostered by a community, by a group of people. They were just not an action brought forward by, or initiated by a Justice Garson, but a group of people, NGO lawyers, grandmothers of May Square. And actually, there is a book that I would recommend you to buy from Catherine Sikin. And the name of it is The Cascade of uh, Justice. Well, she explained that since the Nuremberg trials and since the trials in Argentina, well, there is a fight. There is a fight against impunity. Uh, she shows in a quantitative manner the progress made in the past 30 years, the changes that have taken place. And she also she highlights. And this is your question. After Nuremberg, there were two trials in Greece and in Portugal. But it was the military uh, junta's trials that actually made an impact. But not only because of that, because of the human rights group, people taking care of disseminating all that. And the reaction of people in Spain and the US, uh, many actors, such as Jimmy Carter. So my question is, so I understand why you have devoted most of the time that you were allowed to uh, acknowledge people, people working in favor of justice. So the question is, what happened with why, 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 what happened with the Spaniards when Justice Carson was being accused? Also, in your case, in the case of Franco, there were groups of uh, human rights groups that were supporting that. So I found that that was a paradox because the indignados were indignated sitting on a square, but they were not saying a word about Carson. So, so if indignados and human rights groups do not understand the, 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 this importance, no ch change will take place, will be successful. You've been in that. Why? Why indignados people were not defending the judge that was defending them? Well, your approach is not 100% correct. There was a large sector of the population that supported Justice Garzón. And actually, there was a big demonstration in his favor. Well, there has been demonstrations because of uh, general issues, but such a 
that demonstration, the large demonstration to support him was just unheard of or unseen before. However, the sectors that were supporting Justice Carson had a very little uh, political influence. We are talking about grassroots here. So at the lobbying level, that is to say, at the level of advocating for lobbying, the decisions ruled at the trials, so Carson did not did not enjoy that. And then let me finish with the quote from Prosecutor Mena. And it was, he was interviewed by Jordi Evole, a well-known journalist, and they were discussing the Carson case, justice, and this man he was solidarity with Carson. And when he was asked about the reasons why Carson was uh, eventually suspended and said, who is to blame? And Mena says, it is Carson's fault. It is his fault. And actually, that's, the, that's it. So Carson faced whatever he had to face. And then for many years, he was at the National High Court. He is a contrary to a party man. He never had any connection whatsoever, no limitations due to his ideological um, connections or political party connections, no connections of this kind. It is the example of the Spanish Quixote. That is to say, a person that is fighting against the lack of justice. And what he's been doing so for many, many years. He fought that for many years. And then, well, in the end, uh, he left ca casualties around him everywhere. So, and the answer of Mena, he's not only a friend, he's solidarity with Carson, he's sympathetic with Carson. When he was asked, who is to blame? for all these, and he answered, Carson is. I think, well, it is, says it all. Yeah. All right. So we close with you two, and the question is as follows. What are the groups that you work with to make these gender-based crimes visible and punished? Well, you told us about the social and political context. Well, and now there is a special awareness in society towards any kind of abuse, offenses, crimes, etc. I can remember a quote from Chomsky, American sociologist and philologist, and he says, nowadays, uh, n news Reports are divided between sports, weather forecast, and what in the past was referred to as kind of crimes, which was a small paragraph on the last page on newspaper says kills his wife out of revenge. Or so from there, we have shifted to a situation where the, all the political information goes through the courts. Well, in Spain, in France, and in other countries that share our culture, courts have, have gained a significant political uh, protagonism. Uh, protagonism. Judges have a strong or significant political power. When judges use that power, and put it at the service of major causes for society, such as universal jurisdiction, that causes a commotion, big commotion. So the secret is, the key is tapping into, taking advantage of the social concerns, social awareness in the face of this situation. So because well, the accused of the Nuremberg trials, it is no longer valid, with the exception of Goering and others. Well, they said that they didn't know that concentration camps existed. So this is no longer valid. No one can say that they don't know what's happening in Syria or in Gaza Strip, that they don't know what is happening in some countries. This is not acceptable anymore because we get to see that every day and we pay a high price. Journalists have paid sometimes with their life to show us that. 
that indignation, that rejection on the part of the society should be taken advantage of by the victims' association. They should make use of social media. Some judges, uh, judges from the National High Court have started to use the social media to explain things. And I think that this society can play a greater role or a stronger role than the journalists. Social media have lots of power. The internet is cannot be controlled unless the internet will collapse someday, sometime, may die of its success, but at this point in time cannot be controlled and has a greater influence, a much greater influence that newspaper, paper, newspaper, printed newspaper are in decline and they are read nowadays by the aged or older population, younger generations do not read printed papers and well, they might not watch the news either. They communicate on the internet. I think.